Hello everyone and welcome to Live Education. We are here in the advanced room with another Trader Talks. Um, I'm very happy that we have here our two experts. Today it is Thursday, the 7th of December. And first of all, let's welcome everyone. Um, you are free to, of course, participate in our chat room and ask us your questions. It would be great if you just interact with us. Uh, let us know where you're watching us from. And if you have any questions for our experts, just don't be shy and drop them in the chat room. Uh, first things first, let's welcome our experts. Hello, how is everyone doing? Thank you, good morning. Thank you for the uh, invitation, uh, both to XM, who is doing a good job bringing, uh, connecting people to markets, and of course the people who uh, organized and uh, put the, a lot of work behind the scenes uh, Evangelia, Jill, Anna Maria, Vimos, and everyone that participated in this, earth, in this uh, orchestrated effort who took some time to organize because they needed everything to be perfect. And I'm um, very happy and honored to be here with you. Thank you. We're very happy to have you here. Um, and of course, before we proceed into our, um, into our talk here, uh, we have also our trading expert, Gil Paz. So, hello to you, Gil. Hi, Anna Maria. Hi, Alex. Fantastic to be here. This is actually only the second traders talk that we are having. It is a new concept. We are at XM Life, we are 12 experts, but 12 experts don't cover everything there is to know about trading. There is always other specialities, and we bring in here now in Traders Talk um, world known experts who have expertise that we are not bringing into XM Live. So, Alex, we are absolutely thrilled to have you here. And um, yeah, Alex, he, he is also a certified technical analyst. He developed his own systems and he can give us an angle about the markets that maybe until now we didn't recognize. And so we are really, really pleased to have you here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation, Jill. And I'm really looking forward to our, uh, to our chat. I'm sure it will be uh, mutually beneficial. Absolutely. So, and for all those who are watching us, of course, worldwide, also in the social um, platforms, just that you know, we are streaming every single day on three different channels for free. So you can join, you can go to the website of XM. You should have a link somewhere in those social uh, networks. You have a link and you can join us directly at XM and you can ask questions live if you have. So this is just for the background. And uh, Anna Maria, what do you say? We should start with the interview, right? Of course, I think you said it perfectly. Uh, we're everywhere where, uh, when it comes to social media, so find the link and then follow us here on the website as well. Um, I was thinking for the beginning of this uh, of today's Trader Talks to start uh, by getting to know a little bit better our guest. Uh, so we read in your bio that your trading journey started back in 1998. So would you like to let us know a little bit more regarding this journey? So how did you start it uh, with trading? Um, what did you study? Was this your initial dream or something that happened, uh, you know, as the time goes by? So uh, would you like to let us know a little bit more? Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you for the question. And actually, it brings me back um, many million years ago, actually before <laughs> 96. And the thing is, well, my journey in finance actually started in uh, around when I was like probably around 16 years old um, because my father was in Bank of America. And like any young son who wants to impress their father, um, I wanted to be, be like him, to put it that way. Now, one trip he took to, uh, in England to do as a training for Bank of America, they, um, he joined a, a dealing room there. He saw, so when he came back, he said, look, son, I think that I've been impressed there. So you might want to follow up on that. So to cut the long story short, in 1993, I went to City University to do banking and finance in London. And uh, during my last year in 1996, uh, there was one professor with whom I'm still in contact. Uh, professor, I don't think you would mind if I mention his name. Uh, professor, sure. 
yeah, Roy Bachelor, and I'm really grateful to him. And um, he, he actually, Roy was um, uh, a floor trader in life. Now, he gave up that life to, uh, he actually gave up trading to become an academic in City University. But because he was a practitioner, he actually used technical analysis. And he used technical analysis in an era when it was that well accepted in the uh, academic community. So what he did in, for the first time in 1996 was a course called forecasting. And that course was, uh, in order to present technical analysis, he did a bit of uh, econometrics. So he did technical analysis and um, also did technical analysis uh, in the middle. So econometrics in the beginning, in the end, and technical analysis in the middle. So that was my first time when I really fell in love with it. So that was probably early 1996. And through that, everything took its place. But if I... If I remember right, the 90s, you had to be quite crazy to do technical analyze because that was a world still, or oh, not crazy, but it was like a revolutionary technical analysis because I think until then, almost everybody that did fundamental analyze, is, is that right or? or? No, you're very, you're very correct. I mean, <clears throat> there, were, there were technicians, but it's what we call closet technicians. I mean, people who did not openly use it. I mean, you, you, if, you, if you visit their offices and, for example, they use their, uh, their terminals to check the prices, they did use technical analysis, but because it wasn't that well accepted, they, they saw the value for themselves, but they weren't too open in admitting it. Um, but, you know, things changed over time, not because technical analysis uh, changed, but because its acceptance did. <clears throat> True, I understand totally. I, I, I remember still 20 years ago, many said like, this is like uh, voodoo technical analysis. And uh, really people were very suspicious. They, they wanted, th this fundamental part was extremely important to everyone. Did you use candlesticks or did you have other kind of charts at the beginning? Well, at the beginning, uh, it was uh, a journey for me. Well, basically, it was experimentation. I had to uh, learn as much as I could, so I could then cherry pick whatever I wanted. But uh, I'll tell you what, the first thing, Jill, the, the first thing that I really, um, because initially, I st although I fell in love with technical analysis, I was always at heart a fundamentalist. So I was, my technical analysis was always focused on how to bridge the two principles together. So my technical analysis, initially, I was purely um, bar charts, and from that respect, it hasn't changed. But I always wanted to add macro to it. So the first thing I did, and I was quite liking, because in, in terms of I stumbled, something that I got to use later was intermarket analysis. Mm -hmm. And also got to play around with a lot of, uh, you know, the classic momentum indicators that everyone used. I went through, I, start, I started also with uh, chart, using chart patterns, you know, head and shoulders, um, double bottoms, double tops. But I quickly gave up on that because I thought it was too interpretationally intensive, too subjective. Um, so I've basically I've been through it. It was just a matter of refining it and like rejecting stuff and putting other things into into its place. Just uh, I recognize now that we didn't put the basis. What did you trade then, and what do you tra what asset classes like? Do you trade forex? Do you trade stocks? Do you what what asset classes do you trade? Good question. Well, when I well I graduated in '96, I got my job first job in '98 because I had to do my uh, my military service for two years. Mm -hmm. So when I started in 1998, um, I started as a stock trader, and it was if 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 I showed you on a chart where I started working, it was probably the last part of the bull market. <laughs> so at, at, at that time, I was literally the definition of confusing brains with a bull market. I thought I was so good at it. <laughs> Everything I touched turned gold. I mean, literally, I mean, it was probably the worst time to begin trading. So to come back to your question, yeah, I did. Um, I did stocks, but after a while, I uh, changed to look, looking at uh, bigger asset classes. 
for um, like commodities, mm -hmm. uh, uh, forex, uh, equity indices. I still looked at equity markets, but on an index level, and uh, equity and uh, bonds as well. Primarily G7 bonds. So, and from that, I haven't uh, looked back. By the way, you just met me up. Sorry, Anna Maria, yes. No, no, no. Uh, I find it just really interesting the fact that you both uh, have years uh, trading the markets and you had the time to switch from, uh, to try different things and switch from one asset to the other, try different perspectives, um, everything. So uh, I wanted to ask you both this is a question actually that uh, is for both of you. How Technology. We see that technology, of course, affects our life pretty much in every little aspect of our lives. How uh, did you adapt to the new technologies and how and if, of course, your trading uh, has been affected by technology, the way that you were trading uh, from the minute that you started until today? Do you want to begin or? I, I can start. Look. I started in the end of the 90s and I really remember very good this dot-com bubble and the craziness around it. I wasn't really a trader then. I was more an investor. So I, I just bought and of course we didn't have mobile phones. There wasn't, I bought by telephone. Like I called the, the bank and I told them I want to buy this and this and I actually never sold because Everything just went up and up and up, and I didn't find like I, I didn't understand a lot about technical analysis. I didn't understand about momentum. I just bought, and like you said, Alex, I felt like I'm a genius. Like I make money. I have this natural talent to 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 be a, a genius. <laughs> Obviously, after 2000, I wake up. Um, <clears throat> I started trading only in 2008 and then there was already live charts and there was already technical analysis. <clears throat> and I would say the real re revolution I feel is now happening with artificial intelligence and, and markets become much, much faster with algorithmic trading. And all the cycles that I was used to, they become much faster. I would say the challenges are really today happening. And that's my experience. Hey, Alex, how was it? Um, <laughs> well, I, I would echo these uh, comments. I, I still remember very vividly when I, um, you know, back in 98. First of all, we we didn't at that. Well, well I was actually at the it's very, very early of, uh, electronic order routing. I mean, we literally had to call up and um, the pits to to give the the orders. We didn't, we didn't, there was no such thing. Now, right at the end of it, then we started having a gradual um, input into electronic, like the transition into electronic trading. I mean, all the routing that is. Um, plus, every all the tools that we now take for granted didn't exist at that time. I'll, I'll give you an example. I, 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 I still remember using an elementary technical analysis platform at that time. It was just purely technical analysis. There was no such thing as when you have platforms like um, like MT4 now, when you've got both charting and execution at the same thing. But at, at that time, it didn't exist. You had two separate products. Mm -hmm. One was for execution, one was for charting. And um, I still remember to this day, it was, um, may, mo some of you view viewers may not even uh, understand, it was dial-up modem connection. <laughs> so in order for me to, to get the prices, it made that funny sound, you know, you know, you know downloading the prices. <laughs> and sometimes the prices wouldn't download, so we had to restart the connection again. Uh, it was like primitive, it was like com comparing, um, um, you know, mobile telephony to sending messages with pigeons. <laughs> you know, just joking. But it was, it was, it was a technology has made a, a very big transition. And now you've got electronic platforms, you can uh, have your execution and your charting in the same platform. Uh, and not only that, and technology has made our life so much easier in the sense because we can automate a lot of the tasks we do on a daily basis. So, for example, anyone who's like um, rules-based, they can put their rules in a screener, they can put um, any kind of, uh, any rules-based uh, notification system, so they can make their life easier. 
And um, yeah, technology has made our decision-making also sometimes shorter, although not necessarily better in the sense because news dissemination is much faster. Now you can, something happens um, in Hong Kong and you can know about it within a few seconds. And that's not an exclusive use for professionals, so pretty much anyone can do it. Um, so from an informational point of view, it has leveled up the playing field for everyone, uh, even for uh, um, private, uh, you know, individual investors. It's not just an exclusive privilege of institutionals having, you know, Bloomberg terminals and everything. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, um, technology has made life easier but also a bit more complex in the sense because you've got more moving parts now. Yes, I agree. Um, I mean, definitely technology has made uh, everyone, um, has made it possible for everyone to join the financial markets and to have some uh, attempts uh, in trading. But this, actually, your last comment, um, Alex brought me, brings me to my next question. Has actually all these um, broad, um, you know, the fact that we have uh, access to many news and a lot of information, has it actually uh, made it a little bit difficult sometimes for traders because we have quite, uh, you know, um, a lot of news, a lot of different channels and some people, especially if you're a beginner trader, um, sometimes it's difficult and you you get a little bit confused. Is that right? Is that something that you agree with? Yeah. Yes, I, I would say and not only the news aspect of it, uh, also the social media aspect of it. Because the thing is now you don't have um, news terminals. You also have social news, which is the people's opinions of the news. So if someone logs in and you've got your, your, your news column <clears throat> and then you've got like a, um, I don't know, Twitter or whatever social media platform, so um, it can be both good and bad. It's, it, I, the, I don't try to demonize it, not make, make it into something that is like a, the be all and all of everything. I, I think it's a tool. And if it's properly used, then it can be beneficial. If it's misused, then it can actually be some, you can be made worse, you know, rather than being without it. Um, so again, it, it depends on how you use it. For example, if, if someone um, uh, is... Uh, more of a news trader, depending on your style, and that will definitely help you. If you're rules-based, that may actually be a bit of a distraction for you because it might uh, cause you to deviate from what you had based on the sentiment, your reaction. And of course, if you uh, increase you know, the aspect of social media, it might bring some doubt or fear in the sense that um, you think of the market will do something like that. You take a position and then someone else sends something and then that might start creeping subconsciously. Uh, um, so it can be both good and bad. So if, if you know how to organize your workflow, uh, it can be good. Else it can be uh, pretty much noise, I think. There is, there is a question <clears throat> from one of the viewers here, William is asking, and he says, how many times did you blow up your account and what motivated you to press and to go continue to try to get successful. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, yes, I, I did. I did blow my account. Um, I've done it once. It wasn't a pleasant experience, but it was a very useful one. Well, basically, what uh, happened was uh, bad um, position sizing because accounts can be blown <clears throat> for two reasons, basically. Either they're over leveraged, or uh, they under well, undercapitalized <clears throat> or oh, sorry and the third one is they have to concentrate of a position may not be leveraged but if you're trading like say 60 percent of your portfolio in one position if it's like stocks you can easily blow that up mm -hmm. um so what kept me going is very easy like the love of the game there was I, I don't think there was anything else it's the same thing that keeps me now it's the love of the game i don't think i could see myself doing anything else and uh, so it was motivation for me to figure this out but the uh, first step I had to do was, um, I think that's really important, to assume responsibility. Don't blame mm. anyone else. Don't blame the markets. Don't blame brokers. Don't blame uh, high-frequency trading. Uh, don't blame anyone else. Um, the news, politicians, or someone else trying to, it was, it, it was my fault. So that's, that's who I uh, attribute the mistake to. Because if I said, 
And that gave me, uh, I found that an empowering feeling and thought because I said, okay, if I'm the one that made the mistake, that means that I can correct it. Because if I had given the, the power to someone else and I said, okay, for example, uh, you know, it's Anna Maria's fault, then subconsciously I would be saying that uh, I'm still depending on Anna Maria or Jill or someone else to be for my, uh, responsible for my success or failure. What, what did you do wrong? And when did you realize that you're doing it wrong? And how did you change it? Uh, what I did wrong, I over leveraged. You over leveraged. Very, yeah, I had a very big position. That was the first mistake. And the second mistake was I, uh, I introduced uh, a new type of order. Uh, the move went near. So as my, the market was approaching my stop, I would kept <laughs> changing my, uh, my stop. <laughs> so that was my first, uh, the, the two mistakes I did. And I, when I found out it was too late, I mean, it, it turned from um, trial and error to trial and terror. Did, did it, pro, was this your own trading account or was this even a, you said you were trading? No, it was my own. That was, and that was the ironic part. <clears throat> that was the ironic part. Because for client accounts, I was out. But because uh, I, I was more disciplined, but for my own account, I was, um, no, I, you know, I thought I, I would apply more discretion. I said, it will, you know, it will go back up. And uh, it was actually a duck straight, which I remember to this day. <laughs> so, and that was the ironic part. And that was the really, really ironic part. So you think in general, and I thought this many times, is it easier to trade for a company or for your own money? It's a different, it's a different ball game. Um, first of all, your goals and objectives as an institutional trader are much different. You have different risk mandates. Uh, for example, in, for any money management firm, um, again, depending on the firm, but usually by and large, if you reach a double digit drawdown, even if it's like 10%, you're probably out of the game. For a personal account, you're not given a, a mandate, you're setting it on your own. Mm -hmm. And of course, given that you may have a bigger risk budget, the expected returns will also be uh, bigger. Plus, you don't have to account for anyone. So these are the advantage of proprietary trading versus institutional. Of course, the, the, the issue with proprietary trading is basically you're a hunter. You eat what you kill. <laughs> uh, so there are pros and cons. I mean, um, so it, it's not really better. It's just it's, it's different. So you have to be treated differently. It's, it's not as simple like what I would do. For, I'll give you an, uh, um, an example in my previous in my previous establishment, when I was working for a for a micro fund in the UK, we decided to um, establish a prop trading firm uh, to back traders. Now, whenever people presented their profit and loss accounts, and because they wanted to get hired mm -hmm. or backed by the firm, <clears throat> one thing that we looked at was whether the um, strategy was scalable. So, for example, if someone is scalping and is is a profitable as a scalper. That doesn't mean that he will get he or she will get hired into an institutional firm because scalping may not be that, that thing because it's not scalable. I mean, you can easily scalp an account that has about 150, 200,000. But if you get to more serious amounts like 10 or 20 million, that's not really a scalable strategy. Mm -hmm. So these are the primary. I mean, there are more different, but I think these, <clears throat> these are the main ones. Uh, would you say also, I mean, this is maybe my thought, would you say that because I'm my own boss with my money, that I'm more easy with myself, you know, so I'm not so disciplined because when I have a boss and I know I can get fired, I do what he tells me to do. But if I'm my own boss, you know, I can, I can yeah. be much more easy with myself and then I do more mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's also true. That's also <laughs> true. There's less you're first you're basically your own boss up until of course the time you discover that you're not your own boss, you're own, your own employee. <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, that's true. You have more leeway for um uh, less uh discipline. So that's why extra effort for more discipline is needed. Yeah, that's true. I completely agree with you, Jill. Yeah, so this is <laughs>
Wow. Well, thank you very much for sharing. Actually, that's that's very interesting to get this perspective over here. Um, since you're talking about um, you know success stories or not so successful stories, I would like to ask, what is the typical uh, day, a typical trading day in your life, um, Alex? And of course, then Gil can also let us know about his uh, typical trading day. Sure. Jill, do you want to go first? I have no problem. For me, it's, it's it, so I'm a swing trader. That means I don't do day trading. I don't have position within one day. And I have like routines. So I have the, the most important routine is my weekly routine. On Sundays, I screen the markets and I get a trading plan. Like I put in the products that are interesting for me for the whole week and I trade only those products that I come up with. And that's the weekly analysis. It's also fundamental. It's also sentimental. Um, I have a daily uh, a routine where I start to look what kind of news do we get every single day, where I have to be careful. And I have a monthly routine where I analyze my performance. Did I do well? I give, if, give great to myself. Um, but Trading wise, I would say I spend about two hours per day as a swing trader because I'm not all the time in front of the computer. That, that That's how I'm, yeah, that's my, I would say my, my routine. Perfect. Yeah, I think my, my, my style as well is very, very close to, to Jill's. Um, in general, I would say I'm uh, technique specific, not market specific because generally speaking people can come either they can specialize in one market or one technique so I'm technique specific um, uh, I have what is called an MTMF method multiple time frames multiple factors because I believe that in each time frame it has its own return drivers different things that are affecting it so my um, the time frames I use are the monthly the weekly and the daily the daily is for execution and technical analysis Monthly and weekly are for more macro. So the macro charts go there. And if I'm satisfied, then I switch to the daily. Um, in order, of course, because I apply these techniques across different asset classes in a lot of markets, as aforementioned, I mean, as Anna Maria said and Jill before, I just I have to rely on technology, either for the backtesting of the strategies, and after they have been backtested, for the identification of the opportunities through the use of screeners. So when I get into my computer, I do two tasks. The first one is open position management. That's the first thing if I'm in a position to uh, see where my targets or my stops are. So that's the first thing, the most important thing, because that's my risk. Eh? I have to manage the risk. And once that is done, then I go look into new opportunities. Again, look through the screeners. Um, perhaps we can talk about the methodologies a bit later on. And once I've got that, then I do the um, research to refine techniques or new for new ones. And some parts are mechanical, some parts are discretionary. So by and large, these are the three parts of my, my trading day. But as far as um, checking live prices, I'm pretty much on the same page like Jill. I don't see check prices very often. I don't need to because my... Uh, operating time frame is uh, the daily chart. Wow. So you're longer term than me, actually, because I'm looking in the hourly, four hour and daily chart. Yeah, well, the, the, the trading time, the, the, the positions are basically um, either swing trading, which is as I defined from one to five days. Mm -hmm. And some positions lesser, fewer than the swing trading can be from around, really around two to three weeks if I position it, but that, that's it. So the average holding period for my position is three days. And a few may go into probably week and a half, stretch it out to if it doesn't, if the market doesn't stop me out. But I don't go any lower than that. I mean, I mean, check it for, for you know, just the curiosity of to see if a pattern works on other time frames, but I won't, it won't be actionable for me. So also you mentioned discretionary and automated trading. So you have a mix of both. That's what I'm understanding, right? Part of it you do still manual trading, but other parts you automate it. 
Is that yes, right? Yes, absolutely correct, Jill. You, you mm -hmm. understood that very correct. Well, um, at, I think a trade is broken up in, in four parts, what I call the 4S framework. So it's setup, the, the reason why you want to be long or short, or perhaps flat, the setup. The second is the signal, when you actually get in, because you may be bullish, but it's not actually time for you to get in. Mm -hmm. The second, the third one is the stop, and the fourth one is the size, position sizing. So if you look at it like a, a, a timeline, these four different parts, the two ends of it, the setup and the size, are discretionary. I mean, it's still um, rules-based and data-driven, but at the end of it, I will have a bit of discretion. Mm -hmm. uh, and the discretion comes in for the setup, whether I will take the trade or not. It's not about being bullish or bearish. For example, my, my work may indicate that I'm um, bullish on a market. It won't be a matter of discretion whether I'm bullish or bearish, but whether I will be bullish or not take the position. So it's like bullish or flat once my the tools have shown a direction. The signal and the stop are mechanical. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the size is discretionary in the sense that it reflects my uh, degree of conviction of the setup. So if I feel something is you know, a good opportunity, I might increase it. But the rest of it is, uh, 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 is uh, uh, systematic. That, that is interesting. It's very similar to like I'm doing. What is your minimal risk and what is your maximal risk that you take in a position? Well, it usually goes from 50 to 100 basis points, like a 0 0.5 to 1% the maximum. I've, I've taken bigger positions, but I try to keep it at that. Um, I, I don't feel comfortable. I mean, I, I want to have leeway in terms of like if I have six or seven losing trades in a row, that it won't be too penalizing. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my usual. Usually around zero point, you know, zero point seventy five, zero point five percent, one. I mean, that that's the usual numbers I play around with. I like that. I like that. The, it, it shows that yeah, most you know in, in social networks you see people are risking much more often but in social network that's not the real life right and i like that that you're actually telling here you're risking much less than probably most people would risk yeah i mean it, it's it's a game of um it's a marathon not a sprint as they say um of if if you increase your position size it will you will make it into a sprint and you will go much faster than me but I, i'm not sure if it will it would it will last you know the the same time and as far as performance-wise, and I was actually listening to a very, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to articulate pretty much like I heard it. There was one gentleman who's considered one of the you know uh, best fund managers out there, like Howard Marks, and when he talked about his performance, he mentioned on any given year, I will consciously never be number one. I will always be number two, five, six, ten. If you if you if you rank the the performance of his fund. Mm -hmm. But given over a stretch of times, because he's always fifth, sixth position, seven, fourth, I mean, he's like a top 10, but because it accumulates and because of compounding, on a 10-year basis, he always comes up on top. Yes. So this is how you as well, I, I, on, a, on, a, on a single year, I, I'm sure there will be people that have better performance than me. But over a 10-year basis, I mean, it's, it will be, get a bit trickier. Mm -hmm. I, I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah, that's very humble and very honest. And uh, I wanted to ask, since we're talking about your uh, approach in the markets, um, you said at the beginning that you're both a macro and a technical uh, analyst. So how did you how do you combine uh, the two into your uh, trading style? Um, well, it, it that's a that's a very good question. I hope I'll try to answer it articulate uh, as well. It, well, the my approach actually starts from my core belief, my core belief that both principles are needed and they're not in competition with each other. And they're not in competition because they answer different questions. Technicals answer the when. Uh, fundamentals and macro answer the why. Mm -hmm. So, with different tools and different questions, I will use different techniques to answer these questions. So, in my mind, these are uh, separate and complementary. They're not competing with each other. 
So the question, of course, then um, the challenge is how do you actually, you know, practically, if not from a theoretical point of view, but practically do you combine them? And what I found was that um, they respond to different time frames. Hence, the, what I mentioned before, multiple time frames, multiple factors. So when you look, for example, like economic statistics, that's something that, of course, on a short term basis may affect markets, but that's probably noise. It's the reaction to the actual numbers itself. It's not the number itself. So I tried to I segregate it in order to combine them in different time frames. So I kept the, um, the, for example, the economic statistics on the monthly chart. I mean, be, which is actually the the frequency that they are being um, provided, mm -hmm. announced each month. Then I, the weekly chart, I then do more macro work, like a commitment of traders report, sentiment, intermarket analysis, which is also a big, a big one. And um, what did I leave? Uh, intermarket sentiment. Uh, in, uh, boo, 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 commitment, commitment of traders report. Mm -hmm. So these are the ones that I use on uh, the weekly chart. And once I have a, and this help create my bullish bias. And then I switch to the daily. So to come back to your question, how do I separate them? I separate them by time frame. So keep these weekly and uh, monthly, and then the technical. So they're completely separate. You want to give an example of? let's say one one idea that you had recently that is turning out yeah absolutely uh well crude oil was an idea i was i was looking at basically uh i was looking at the commitment of traders report uh for those that may or may not know commitment of traders report it shows you the positions that are held by big players sometimes they call it as legal insider trading so you can see what big money is doing there, whether they're holding or they're basically whether they're distributing or they are um, accumulating a, a particular market. So through that, I was seeing that um, crude oil was under distribution. Now, the commitment of traders report is not uh, a timing tool, but it's a setup tool. Mm -hmm. So from that, you also uh, check on the uh, intermarket. There is an, a cycle that... Michael's uh, markets go through an intermarket cycle that was uh, pioneered by uh, by someone gentleman called uh, Leonard Ayers and uh, popularized and worked upon by my good friend Martin Fring. So also check that to see where is the relationship between the various asset classes like commodities, uh, bonds, and equities. Mm -hmm. And through that you could see that commodity was also weak, so there was an influence of that as well. Then you go into uh, sentiment and seasonals and. Uh, if someone checked the seasonal charge, where, you know, basically where statistically during a year there is a propensity for markets to go up or down. During the last part of the year, which we're calling now, it's a, uh, it is a seasonally, traditionally seasonally very weak period. Mm -hmm. Now, the seasonals are suggestive of what may happen. It gives you a glimpse into the future, but they're not mandatory because there may be other um, forces which for this year they may not play out. It's just that it happened that this year they also played out as well. So when I look at the macro factors, um, all five of them, I don't require that all five of them have to be aligned because it's very rare. I just yeah. need three of them. One may be, say, so you go, I live in a, 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 um, a weight of the evidence or a, a gray zone. Mostly it's never black and white. It's usually shades of gray. So if I've got three that are uh, bullish, sorry, three that are bearish, one is maybe bullish and one neutral, that's okay for me. So that's one of the setups I had for uh, crude oil. Fantastic. I, li I like it. By the way, COT report, this is in my absolute heart of my analyzer. So that's what I do really <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> um, you told me, we had an interview before we started here the, the main, a few weeks ago, you told me that you have a certificate in CFT and uh, ATAA. Tell us a little bit, what do you learn there? How do you become a certificated technical analyst? What did you learn and do you use the things that you learned there? And, and, and what does it give you? Because I might think that many of the traders here, they're interested maybe also to get it more 
to the next level, you know, technical exactly. analysis? Um, that's, a, again, a, a good question. Well, I got certified as a technician, if memory serves, around 2000 or 2001. So that was a long time ago. Well, the, the reason for it, where I wanted to get certified were two or three reasons. The first one was because um, I was studying technical analysis at that time anyway, but I felt that I need a more structured pathway, a syllabus. Mm -hmm. for me to rather than picking up books or going to uh, Amazon or any other book. I don't think it was Amazon was, was it still operating there <laughs> at that time? So, so uh, it was, it was it provided me with a syllabus. So that was the first thing. The second thing that is not just doing the work itself, but also have something to show for it. Um, because right now I could say, okay, I'm the most, you know, knowledgeable person in the world, which of course I'm not, uh, and then say, okay, I've done so much work, but that's just my word. If you have a certification, it doesn't mean that you're an expert, but it does mean that you have a, a, have a, a core understanding of the basics. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to have that on me. It was like a stripe saying, okay, now you, you've done some work and you're above a threshold level. It doesn't mean that you're an expert, but you certainly have dedicated time to your craft. So um, when I was looking at that certification at that time, because, you know, having studied in England, the first um, option was me for to do, was to do the SDA exam, the, uh, the British Society of Technical Analysts, but they didn't have a syllabus at that time. So I said, okay, who else is available that has a very good syllabus? At that time, the, um, the Australian Technical Analysts Association had a very, very strong uh, uh, course. Uh, if, if I remember correctly, the, the, it was, um, the book was by a gentleman called Nicholson. And the chairman of the association well, at that time was also a Greek. So a fellow Greek. So I thought, okay, <laughs> I'm out as well. That's, uh, it would be a familiar uh, voice. And that gentleman, who actually we're very much in, in contact with, he's a STEAM professional um, in uh, Australia, still working. His name is Peter Podikis. And Peter and I became very, very good friends for the past 20 plus years. So that was my first certification. So he was my first quote unquote mentor. Mm -hmm. And from that, I also did the CFT as well because there was a lot of overlap between the two um, uh, certifications. So I said, okay, for the price of one, I will get two. <laughs> so that's how I, I got involved. And then afterwards I got involved with the CMT association. I didn't get that certification, uh, but that, that was the journey. But I would encourage people to get certified as technical analysts. Um, it, first of all, it will give you a broad perspective. It will uh, force you to highlight things that you may not do on your own. For example, I had to uh, do like Elliott wave analysis. I had to do GAN. I had to do Fibonacci, things that I wouldn't be using later on, but I had to learn it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a good structured uh, learning, uh, you know, learning path. So you, you recommend that everybody does it, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I would uh, wholeheartedly, uh, both the technical analysis or the CFA or the CMT, actually, or the CMT. And if someone had to choose uh, um, a certification to do, I would, ask, I would recommend to do the CMT Association, but the Chartered Market Technicians Association, because it's the only technical analysis certification one may get that provides exemption from a regulatory authority. For example, if you want to uh, work in the United States, uh, in order to get, uh, you have to have a professional license. There are various, like Series 67 and so on and so forth. There are various uh, uh, professional licenses you have to get. And it, the CMT exam and the CFA are the only uh, examinations that get you an exemption for these. So you get something extra other than the technical analysis designation. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it set the foundation in your trading, the way that you started with uh, your yeah. background studies. Absolutely, in a way, in a way, it did because it forced me to mm -hmm. to learn. Yes. Plus, you know, it's it's also uh, having a deadline also helps. <laughs> uh, yes, I understand. I can relate to that. <laughs> I heard actually it's one of the most difficult studies you can do. I, I didn't do it, I, I have to say. I didn't do it, um, but I heard it's like 
it's a tough study. It's not so easy to pass. Well, yeah, the, well, the, yes, it, it is a bit challenging, but to tell you the truth, and I'm sure you will relate to this, Jill and Anna Maria, I mean, we can all make it as difficult or as easy as we want to through work and uh, dedication. The more work you, we put into it, the easier it gets. Uh, but yeah, of course, there is, there is some amount of work uh, involved. It's not a uh, work in the park. But that said, it's believe me, it's easier now to get certified as a technical analyst back in the day when I was doing it, because now there are organized series, for example, the CMT examination. Um, it's got an association, a partnership with Wiley. And so they've got three big books. So you've got one book to read, because back in my back in the day, we had to get um, like, oh, from that book, we have to uh, study chapter five. From that part, you have to chapter study six. So we had to buy a, a host of books and then cherry pick which uh, chapters we would like to do. Because at the syllabus is at that, with the exception of the Australian Technical Analysis Association, everyone else provided a syllabus. And they said, oh, from Murphy's book, you have to read these chapters, from Fink books, these chapters. But now you can get organized courses. I understand. Um. Time, time flies, uh, Anna Maria. Actually, I think we, we try to get you also know. I mean, this is the end of the first session. We have only five minutes left. Um, we have some random questions, and we uh, do. <laughs> in order to know you better. And then in the second hour, we do it. Um, we do a more practical continuation of uh, of our interview. Exactly. So, in a way, we wanted to, as Gil said, we wanted to know you a little bit better. So we have some let's say off topic questions. Um, first of all, uh, actually, would you consider yourself yourself a book person or a movie person? And uh, according to your answer, what is the book or the movie that you recently watched and influenced you a lot? Good question. Um, I would say probably a lot more uh, a book person than a movie. Um, both for or, well, for technical analysis, yeah, I prefer books. But if we if we take it to literature, um, I prefer books because the author describes he what you know his work, but then through reading it, I let my imagination picture it. But if I see it on a movie, then I let the director be my eyes, and I see it not just from the author's point of view, but from the director's point of view. So even if it's to see a movie of a um, that refers to a book, I prefer to read the book first and then see the movie and see how my perspective differs from the director's. But uh, so yeah, I would probably say more of a book person than a movie movie person. But you know, I, I enjoy movie as much. Okay, thank you for sharing. And is there a book uh, in this case that you would suggest to our viewers to uh, to read? Uh, it doesn't have to be anything, you know, something that has to do with trading, but in general. Um, there are good books. Um, oh, I'll tell you one, one good book. It's a bit uh, personal. I don't know how many people will relate to it. One of the things that I um, had as a person I had to struggle with was perfectionism. <laughs> and uh, in order to, and one good book I found on the subject was by a gentleman called Stephen Guise, G-U-I-S-E. So that's the first book that came to my mind okay. outside, of, uh, uh, outside of trading. So if anyone has a an, uh, thing with perfectionism, joke at St Stephen's books. Uh, no, that's good. Um, also, I'm very much interested in uh, psychology mm -hmm. and especially child psychology. Um, so that is something that really interests me in parenthood. Um, what else? I would say that probably my interests are very focused. I mean, the books I read either through, um, either through trading uh, both markets and technical analysis. The second one would be a psychology, uh, trading or not. And the third one would be spiritual books. So these are the two things I, I don't have. Mm, so I'm very focused, very narrow, if you want to mm -hmm. look at it from that point of view. 
Thank you very much for sharing. Actually, um, and of course, I know that our viewers would appreciate it as well. Uh, it is my time to leave you to continue your uh, talk. We will go to a small five minute break and we will be back. Thank you for, you know, for being here, Alex, with us in today's uh, Trader Talks. Everyone just stay tuned. Uh, Gil and Alex will continue for the next hour with more trading. So um, that's it. See you in a bit. Anna Maria, thank you very much. You've been a wonderful host. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much, Anna Maria. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session here at Traders Talk with Alex. Alex, thank you so much that you really took your free time to be two hours with us. Um, it was fantastic to, to know you in the first hour. We even didn't finish yet, really. So I will, I will start with finishing the first hour with a couple of random questions just to know you. And then we go back to your trading strategy. We go deeper in this hour to your trading strategy, how you analyze and how you trade. Okay. So cool. to your trading system. Um, my first question to you is um, what kind of holiday do you like? Are you a, a person that likes to relax on the beach and not do anything? Or are you a city guy and sightseeing cities? Or you're an adventure guy who goes into the into the mountains? Um, that's a good question. I would say I'm definitely a go to the... Well, my wife and I have two types of holidays. One is <laughs> the relax at the beach and do absolutely nothing. And the mm -hmm. second one is we go out sightseeing when we try to jump back as many things as we can. And by the end of the day, we're literally exhausted. So to give you an example, a few <laughs> months ago, we were in Spain. We visited uh, Barcelona and Valencia. And we saw so many things. But th at the end of the journey, we had to um, note down everything we said because it was like so much, so much stuff. So it was like completely exhausting. We need a holiday from our holiday. <laughs> so, but, so, but when we go to the beach, then that's completely vegging out. I mean, we'll go to the beach. We'll, you know, take food with us. We'll, you know, obviously we'll be away from, you know, obviously we'll be away from people because we want to be on our own, relaxing. So these are the mm -hmm. two extremes. Fantastic, and you're combining. And I, I assume on the beach you are recharging from all your work you're doing during the absolutely, year. <laughs> absolutely. Fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask you about a trading book also that really influenced you that you can recommend also to the viewers. Um, good point. Right. Uh, well, my answer to that would be depending on the topic or actually the level, because there are you know five levels to trader development. And depending on where the person asking me is on that scale, on, that, on, that, on these stages, I would recommend different books to them. So if you're starting out on the first stage, it's a different thing. But if you're on, like, on the fifth stage and you want something more specified, I would differ, recommend a different book. But more generally speaking, to come back to your question, I would recommend uh, books from my two good friends, um, Larry Williams, Tom DeMarc, um, also by uh, friends of mine like uh, Bollinger, uh, John Bollinger and Martin Prink, because each one has a different style. For example, Martin, mm -hmm. uh, I had the pleasure of meeting probably 10 years ago, um, 12. Um, he combines technicals and fundamentals very well. So if someone asks me, okay, where can I find a book about that? I would direct him to that or Intermarket Work by uh, John Murphy. If someone wanted to do commitment mm -hmm. of traders' world, you know, obviously, you know, would be Steve Breeze or Larry Williams. Um, if, <laughs> if they want to do some more uh, innovative techniques for price exhaustion, um, obviously, you know, the, the question would be to, you know, um, the answer would be uh, Top the Mark, who's a brilliant, brilliant, he's like a genius. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, it depends. If you want to be more, understand a bit more about charting in general, there, there depends on the of the topic you want to emphasize. Okay, amazing. 
Um, what, what are your hobbies? What do you do outside when you try to relax from the charts? And uh, what, what do you do? Oh, spend time with my family. I think that's number one. Uh -huh. And also because I have the, uh, the pleasure of not living in an urban environment. My wife and I um, moved away from urban environment. I don't live in London. I'm in the south. And our house mm -hmm. is out in the countryside, which gives me the opportunity to be in a wonderful environment. And near the forest, uh, we're like a five to ten minute drive from the sea, the ocean. Uh, so wow. spending time outside, that is also weather permitting, of course. <laughs> uh, that is also something I, I enjoy. And uh, with friends and family. I, I also like photography. Um, my father-in-law gave me a, a camera when I got, well, my wife and I got engaged. So I did a course to learn how to use it properly. And I, <laughs> I learned some kind of like basics, but never emphasized too much on it. So photography as well. So that's, that's my general interest. That is very interesting for me because that's my hobby too, that I, I use photo photography as, you know, as a balance, like it's my artistic part. What, what kind of camera do you um, have? Well, it's a, it's a Canon. My father-in-law gave it to me. It's, not, it's, not, um, it's nothing too specialized or anything. I don't remember the type, to tell you. I understand. Um, so I'm not, too, I'm not advanced or anything like that. So I, I just tried to learn how to use it. I didn't... Uh, I love photography, but I, I, can't, I, don't, I can't say that I love it enough for me to, like, give it, you know, learn more about the tools, the techniques, and I mean... I'm a hobbyist, and as a, mm -hmm. as a hobbyist, I do things when I want, not because I have to. Absolutely. And um, now I come back to, to our theme, to trading. And by the way, the viewers, we are in so many different channels. I can't watch all the questions on the different channels. So I have the advanced room channel open. And if you want to jump in and write questions, please do it in advanced room. Otherwise, I think the administrator will will push me also some questions and that will help. But um, just just that you know that on my screen, when I look here on the right side, I look at the questions from uh, from the advanced room. Um, you mentioned five stages to become a trader. Please elaborate. What are those five stages? Yeah, well, um, yeah. Pretty much like anything else, there are levels to this. I mean, there are levels of learning. The first, as a general introduction, uh, it was um, I, when I, before I created the smart uh, trader system, which basically tries to identify where you are at that stage and uh, um, mm -hmm. use the proper tools and techniques for it. I got in, uh, influenced by uh, the work of someone called Noel Birch. I, I mean, you probably know the conscious and um, and uh, the conscious and unconscious competence model. Uh, basically, it was four levels. You know, the, without getting to elaborate, the, the bottom one is unconscious incompetence. Well, basically, you don't know that you don't know. The okay. second is conscious incompetence. You still don't know, but now you're aware of your ignorance. The second, the second <laughs> level is actually a conscious competence. I mean, you're good, but you have to be very, you know, deliberate about. It. You have to think what you're doing. And the fourth level is unconscious competence. With this, basically, you've, you've become so good at something that it's become second nature. You don't have to think about it. So taking this model, I, I tried to adapt it for trading. And But instead of doing uh, four levels, I did five. And they formed the acronym SMART. Okay. So the first level is S for self-awareness. Because that's the first thing that people have to know um, in order to, uh, you know, uh, get to know what is their, their, uh, the, and use that, the grow model. Grow means for uh, goals. You know, what is your goal of trading? Do you want to trade for income or do you want to trade for growth? Do you want to be trading part time, full time? Because there's a different path you will be following that. Then you have to look at the R for these, the realities. So it's such the mm -hmm. model within the model. And the realities being basically what is the roadmap to go from point A to point B. The O is the ob uh, object, I mean, what will be obstructions in your way? And then the W is the will. I mean, how much are you willing to commit to this? So once you've done mm -hmm. this self-identification and self-evaluation, you're still at the level one, the S. If you've got that, then you have to go to level two, which is the M, M for market knowledge. Then you go into seeing 
uh, the technicals and the fundamentals. And uh, there is a roadmap that I've created, the 10-step roadmap with the tech uh, uh, outlines. I mean, we, we briefly touched upon it. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Touches about how to combine technicals and fundamentals. So that's the market knowledge. A lot of people get lost here as well. I mean, we can be spending a lot of time on this, but let's briefly outline it. The third level is the A for action plan. Because during okay. the second level, you're getting the knowledge. Is uh, If you put it in a cooking analogy, you're learning what the flour, the butter, and the milk is. You're learning the ingredients. But mm -hmm. having the ingredients, that does not mean you have a recipe. Okay. So at the third level, which is the action plan, you take the ingredients, the fundamental and, uh, and the technical ingredients, and you put them to a recipe. In our lingo, that's a trading strategy. Mm -hmm. and, but, as we all know, Again, going back to the cooking analogy, having a recipe does not make you a cook. Yes. yes. So you need to practice. And so that brings us to the fourth level, which is the R, which is repeat, record, and review. And that's the difference that makes the difference. Because um, someone can ask, okay, give me a strategy, and I could provide it with them. But they, by and large, will fail. And the reason is because you have to practice it. You have to work on it. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a plug and play, and that's what that's the difference that makes the difference. That people who are really committed to the people that are interested, because at the first level your motivation level is zero. You just want to get uh, rich quick. At the second level, yes, uh, you're interested. At the third level, you're just you know a bit enthusiastic about it. But the fourth level, when you actually get to practice, uh, then that's the commitment level. And then you reach the fifth, which is the trading level. You know, actually, then you at the T, you become, you become at the mm -hmm. fifth stage. And of course, you have to do work on them. You have to work on your techniques, uh, keep uh, uh, because markets change, um, that some tools become obsolete, so you have to replace them with new ones or find new ones. So complacency is not, uh, shouldn't be part of our vocabulary. So these are the basically five, and at each stage, you have to be using different uh, systems, if you will, because it's a stage, it's own system. So I, I think this is amazing how you put it. You very simplified the, the past, and I, I totally agree what you're saying. Well, what do you, would you say for each stage, how long does it take? Like, because in the internet, you know, people try to mm -hmm. tell you, you can be a trader in a week and you just uh, double your account every every month. Is this <laughs> a week? That's it... too long. <laughs> um, no, I mean, again, the, the question of uh, timing to achieve these goals, um, I cannot say how much it will take. I can, what I can take is what is the minimum it requires. Because mm -hmm. uh, what actually goes, it, it depends on very various personal circumstances. For example, if someone asks me, okay, teach me how to, to do this. A, the, who, my, we might have Gil who comes as a, is able to devote full time to it. Or for example, as we know, we sp spoke with uh, previously with Anna Maria. Anna Maria may come and say, look, I'm a part time. So people will come with different, uh, with different time. The second thing mm -hmm. is that they may come with, different educational background. So that yes. may be both good and bad because um, I usually prefer people who um, come with an open mind because sometimes learning to learn is easier than learning to unlearn. So to come back to your question and provide a time frame, I think it's very realistic to go from level one to level three. I mean, know the basics, I have strategies, within, I don't know, probably two to three months. But mm -hmm. the really, the longer part is the th fourth stage. So going back to the Pareto principle of 80-20, it should be 20% yes. theory and 80% application. So if someone asked me, I have a year to this, to commit to this, I would say three times for th uh, three months for theory and then nine months for practice. Um, it doesn't have to be one year, but I would say it's difficult to be less than six. If you're, I mean, if you're serious, you know, if you want to be completely honest with yourself. 
and I think you are you're optimistic. I think most people it will take even yeah, longer. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I'm, I'm just yeah. <laughs> right again for most people, like you said, it's, it will, might take even longer. It again depends how much you know time you have to devote to this. Absolutely, I I, I agree. Um, I want to come so so. I want to go a little bit back. You made you made a certificate. You became a technical analyst. You learned there the basics, but as you just explained, also with the smart trader system, it doesn't stop with the basics. You have to develop your own system. And um, I, I would like f first and foremost, I would like to ask you, no. Later, I want to ask you, what is your system? Please explain your system in detail. I think the viewers are very interested to understand that. But also, you became a part of the CMT Association, and you met a lot of, of people who, and you mentioned in the previous hour, um, Mr. Bollinger and Tom DeMarc, and what did they give you? I mean, explain a little bit. I mean. For me, this is absolutely amazing because I, I wrote those the, the books of them. They are really heroes for me. You know them personally. What did it give it to you? <laughs> uh, it gave me a different perspective. Well, let me let me begin the the, the journey. Sometime in two thousand and nine, late two thousand and nine, the CMT Association uh, wanted to expand from being a U.S. based organization to being more international. And the reason that mm -hmm. happened is because they had, um, they put a lot of their educational material online, so it started getting being accessed from all over the world. So the next logical step was then for them to group together the people that joined online from the same locale, so and create chapters. So I was mm -hmm. approached to create or to be the, the founding chairman of the UK chapter. And the person that suggested, because they were looking for someone for a basically looking for a UK connection, and, and they they didn't know anyone that well. But the only person that knew me that well was uh, John Bollinger, and so he suggested and he said, okay. "Go find this guy. He's our guy." And, and I was um, I was very honored, of course. I mean, my first um, meeting was with John. So subsequently, it was uh, with a gentleman called Ken Tower and Ralph Campora. So they came over. And uh, they said, okay, do you want to run the chapter? I said, fine. So I was running it for a very long time, probably around, up until uh, from 2010 up until COVID. And we'll be beginning to uh, reestablish it shortly. But during this period, what I, uh, I got to meet a lot of uh, established uh, speakers, some well-known, some not very well-known because they work in the institutional world, so they haven't published books or done anything to provide them that much you know, uh, exposure. And what I found was that um, the depth and the breadth of knowledge that people have. I mean, given that the study of technical analysis is just uh, a few, fun, like open, high, low, close, volume, and open interest. But there are so many ways to combine it. And I was really a humbling experience to meet people that found so many in new and innovative ways. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that I learned from a knowledge point of view is to get different techniques. The second thing that I learned, and um, I kind of like knew it, but that helped me solidify that belief, was that you have to build a methodology and a time frame, of course, that is fitted for you. There is no such thing as the perfect methodology or perfect system. There is a perfect system for you. So the semi-systematic way was perfect for me, and it may be perfect for others, but it won't be perfect for everyone. It, it, will be, it will be valuable to a large amount of people, and it's acceptable if people take my methodology and adapt it to their own needs and characters. So that was the first thing. So you can see a lot of successful people that were um, using different time frames and different tools. And um, of course, um, the, the, another, the third thing I realized was that the more successful someone was, um, there were less... Uh, arrogant because they were more sure of themselves. They mm -hmm. didn't have to prove anything. So they were very humble, uh, very approachable. Um, 
And if you give, they're more willing to share their work. I mean, it was, I mean, just you shoot an email, they get the answer back. I mean, you get their point in the right direction. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a great experience for me. I got to um, meet also Linda Rashki, who's also in the Market Wizards book. Um, Linda it's amazing. A, yeah, actually, Linda is married to a, a Greek fellow Greek called uh, uh, Damon Pavlatos. Um, yeah, she, and now that talk about books, and Anna Maria mentioned in the previous part of the interview, which book would I recommend? Now, that's a good book to recommend. A lot of, I'm sure a lot of people read books on the glorified side of trading, uh, like the market wizards and so on and so forth. But yes. there is a book which actually exposes someone into the um, issues they had, the challenges, the mistakes they did. And that's Linda's Trading Sardines. It's very short, but very entertaining, but also very humbling, very educational. It gives you an in-depth look into how Linda works. And I was happy to have it. Actually, I'm not in my office. I would give you a copy which Linda sent me herself. And um, it was probably one of the best books I've read. Uh, it, uh, first of all, it's a very uh, true insight of what goes into someone's head, even if they are at the top level, because most people may think that uh, they, they have a, an exaggerated view of, uh, of someone who's successful. But no, if you look at the hard works, the reality, their day-to-day -day challenges, they're pretty much like everyone else. And of course, it was, a, uh, was very humbling. It was a very human touch to something mm -hmm. that may be overly glorified. I must say, I hope we can get Linda Rashke also once to our interview. She's really amazing. I had also the opportunity to know her. Um, by the way, you mentioned John Bollinger. For the viewers who don't know who is John Bollinger, we have in the MetaTrader, we have an indicator based on him. So if you go here to insert indicators, and um, Bollinger, I think it is, now I have to be here we have the Bollinger Bands. Yep. That's John Bollinger, what he's talking about. So really legendary people that, that uh, you know. Absolutely. It's, it's basically two standard deviations based on statistical theory. I'm sure John can uh, explain it much more. I'll tell you how not to use now that we are on the issues of tools and techniques. I mean, um, perhaps next time I can give you my the Mac DV, the indicator yes. I created and I got awarded for. And, um, but going back to the chart now here that we see here on Bollinger Bands, I'll tell you one, one thing that people do. They, they consider it as support and resistance. True. But actually, it is not. There, there, is, there is no reason why prices hitting the upper band. It's just, a, uh, as John calls it, a tag. And it measures volatility. And volatility is one of the core, uh, you know, f the five characteristics, the core characteristics of price. Absolutely. So, so what you're saying, it, yes, you're, you're right. It shows the standard deviation that it's the 95 percentage. He uses normally the second standard deviation, and that means that 95 percent of the time the price should fall within the, those bands. And then when prices start to fluctuate stronger, then actually the Bollinger Band go farther apart. And when we are in a smaller range, they, they narrow exactly. down. That's what it. Yeah, the theory says that it should be 95%. Uh, if it is, if prices were normally distributed, as we say in statistics. True. But in, in practice, it's not. I mean, if you actually measure how much time is above, it's, uh, it's uh, less than that. I understand. So, yeah, so this is, a, again, this is John Bollinger. And uh, it, it's actually interesting. All the people you are mentioning, John Bollinger, Tom DeMarc, no, Linda Rashka, I don't think, but um, Tom DeMarc definitely also. They developed their own cool. indicator, and you just hinted also that you developed your own indicator. Please yeah. elaborate on that. <laughs> well, the indicator I create, okay, now that you have a, a chart in front, it would be a good uh, uh, opportunity to give you the background behind it. Okay, do you want to plot, for example, here the stochastic oscillator? Yes. Let's insert indicator oscillator and stochastic, stochastic is here start from the bottom yeah that's the one if and, you and put what, that, if you what can put parameters? Like period, uh, 14 say uh period the k period uh yeah the k is the quick put uh, d uh as uh, uh how much yeah. with k 
the k leave it at three uh it's the smoothing on uh, the percent div, the div put at 14. you know it's the, the, the usual default setting uh it's the usual wait the usual is five three three yeah you can put uh, well the uh, george lane had it as although there is a big debate with George Lane or uh, a gentleman called Dyson did it. If you want to be putting it as uh, 14, well, it's basically the, the average. D is, sorry, I'm... Yeah, yep. D is 14. Yes, please. Okay. I click OK. And maybe I give it the other colors so it gets a little bit more <clears throat> stronger just for the screen here. Okay. Perfect. Now, you, maybe you can uh, open it up a bit and put the uh, slow as the uh, and change it as well. No, 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 sorry. Uh, open the settings as well. And the red one so to make the, it also. Yeah. The uh, sh right, okay. So can you open it? Sorry, can you open the settings again? Yes, of course. Uh. All right. Put the uh, percent K as 14, sorry. Okay, here 14 and, and here, three. Yeah, right. and here five? Yeah, five, you want three, it's this, you know, it's fairly, fairly. All right, there you go. <clears throat> now you can see it's a bit more smoother. Now the one, I'll tell you first, of all, okay, this is the stochastic oscillator, the stochastic, okay, let's, let's do a bit of a intro into what the uh, stochastic oscillator does. The stochastic oscillator basically it tells you where you are within the range of a look back period. So if you ask the question the, uh, with reference to the past, say, 14 days, as we picked in this um, uh, example, mm -hmm. my current price is it high or low? Okay. So that's the question it answers. Now, one of the issues that the stochastic oscillator has is that uh, it doesn't really measure momentum. It is considered as a momentum indicator, but actually it's not, it doesn't me uh, uh, measure speed, it measures uh, range. So if you say, with the past four days, am I high or low? And that's it, but it doesn't measure speed, velocity. And one of the issues it has um, actually, before I tell you the issues, let me talk about um, momentum indicators in general. Now, there are literally hundreds of momentum indicators, literally. But if you want to simplify your life and try to understand where they're coming from, you'll see that they come in two broad categories. The first one is normalized and range bound, sort of like the stochastic indicator you have. Mm -hmm. A range bound because it can go from zero to hundred, and normalized because the price you see uh, at the, on the on your chart is the same scale as it was like ten years ago, or compared to other markets. It's on a percentage basis. Basically, the number here is like sixty percent or seventy percent. It's on a percentage basis. Now, the other type of indicator you have is unbounded and unnormalized. For example, like the MACD. If you want to plot the MACD, you'll see the difference. Yes. Okay. Insert indicators, oscillator, probably... MACD, and... Leave it as the default, yeah, 14, 12, 14, yeah, 12, 12 26, 9. Ah, wait, maybe I make also here the colors a little bit just darker, everything, yep. so we can see it better. Absolutely. Okay. All right, so if you... If you the... These two indicators are supposedly they're doing uh, working on momentum, but they are they have character distinctly different characteristics. The stochastic oscillator goes from zero to hundred, which means it has the minus that it cannot adapt with the market. So, for example, I'm not sure if I seen this in the chart. Probably, I think this was in May 2022. Uh, before, sorry. The, yeah, after after the call after COVID drop now just go before that. Left, 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 left. There you go. Okay. Now, after COVID, you see now on the rally that happened afterwards. If you scroll the cursor to the right slowly, and again, again, a bit more. As you, you see, the market was rallying. The indicator started yes. rising as well. Okay. Yes. Now scroll it forward a bit. 
a bit more, a bit, no, stop it there. Now, from that point onwards, you can see, check the chart above and check the yes. oscillator. The market yes. continued increasing in price, but the stochastic oscillator, because it is range bound, it could not get a higher value. It was because it's zero to a hundred, it got pegged at this high level. What you're saying is the, the market stayed in extreme territory for a prolonged period of time, right? Yes, but the indicator did not indicate that because it could go from zero to a hundred. Yes. Now, if you leaving the cursor where you have it, check the bottom panel, which is the MACD. The MACD continued rising. If you see, yes. without scrolling the green line, but pointing with your cursor, you can see that it was slowly growing up. The, yes. MA, the, uh, the stochastic oscillator could not do that. It got high and it stayed there. Yes, true, here. Exactly. Very well, very well, Gil. So what we're saying is these two different types of indicators. The one is the normalized and uh, bound, and the one is unnormalized and unbound. Now, what, each one has its advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage, as we mentioned, for the normalized one is that it's getting pegged at high levels. Mm -hmm. can go part of, So when you have strong moves, that's it. It can only stay that high. The advantage of the unbound is that they can adapt with markets. Exactly. Yes. The problem, however, with unbound indicators is that they are absolute price. They measure, they don't measure percentages. They measure ticks, pips, points. So the MACD indicator, if you look at its absolute value, so for example, what you're having it, oh, okay, there you go. You see, it says, what's the value? 296 or 2694? Yes, 294. All right, 294. But 294 doesn't respond to any kind of measure of momentum. It's just the price. You've got the 12 moving average. You've got the 26. You take the difference, so it ends up 296. But if you apply the MACD on a different product, you won't get 296. You will get a different price because it's a, just a function. The value of the indicator is a function of the underlying price. So and that has the causes the problem that although you can see the, whether momentum is increasing or decreasing, but the value it has is useless. You can't compare it over time. And you can't compare it across securities because now we're seeing what's the, the chart of the S&P 500, right? Yes, that's the S&P 500. Perfect. Now, if you, if, you, if you try the MACD on something that is very, very low priced, like a currency, the MACD will not be 265, it will be 0 0.001. Yeah, because it's pips. Exactly. So you've got the differences in the MACD do not re relate to different levels of momentum. It's just a function of the underlying price. I understand. So at that time, around 2015, having noticed the limitations of these two broad categories of indicators, I wanted to create a new type of indicator, which would combine the benefits of the stochastic oscillator, which is a normalized reading, mm -hmm. and the benefits of an unbound indicator, which is, is freedom to move. I understand. So I, what I did is I took an unbound indicator, the MACD, and normalized it, so I had, in theory, the best of two worlds. And I published this work that I did in 2015, in 2022. And um, it was, you know, uh, innovative, groundbreaking, however you want to call it. But it got awarded by the CM2 Association. They have a, an award. It's called the Charles Dow Award. The Charles Dow Award basically is a, an award for innovative research. About, okay. I think if memory serves, about 25 or 26 people have won it in the world. And... It, in 2022, it won first prize for my work on the MACDV. It was a 40-page uh, research. I mean, people, go people Google it, they will find it. Um, and also, I, I sent a paper to the National Association of Active Investment Managers. They have an equivalent uh, competition. It's called the Founders Award. When again, they, they provide uh, awards for advances in active investment management. And they also found it very useful and awarded it. Uh, I think it, it creates um, a breakthrough between these two categories of range bound and unbound. It creates, and uh, it's uh, it will be freely available. If if I can provide you with a code, then you can freely distribute it to 
your users are don't get anything by it. I mean, the, the code is already out there. It's public. I mean, it's not public property, but it's public knowledge. Okay. Um, now, so so you. By the way, did you study mathematics, or how did you come up, or was this just a determination, you know, and you learned everything? Uh, well, the, 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 that's a good question. Well, the way I figured it out is by trying to reverse engineer what was wrong. Okay. All right. So we talked about, you know, trying to normalize the two types of indicators. There, to be completely honest, there was an attempt to normalize the MACD. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work. And I'll tell you what the normalization is. So the, the formula for the MACD is moving average 12 minus the 26. Okay. Yes. So what they did is 12 minus 26 divided by the price. So they put it in percentage. Okay. So you don't have 256, whatever is the value of the MACD, 256 as a function of the price of the underlying asset. So it's 256 divided by... Uh, the value, what's the value of the S&P 500 now, divided by the S&P 500. And if you multiply it by 100, you get it in percentage. So basically, it's a, a percentage MACD. I did not discover this, but mm -hmm. it was already available. Now, the thing is, if you look carefully into this, because uh, of a factor that I will mention later, this percentage normalization is not successful across markets. It works across the same asset class. Okay. But if you compare the MACD percentage, PPO as it's called, for example, the S&P 500, in the paper I compared S&P 500, natural gas and bonds. So if you compare it, you will find it has different fluctuations. Okay. So that's where my question came and I said, why is it? Because if you're comparing theoretically oranges with oranges, it's percentage with percentage. Yes. But one does they oscillate more than the other. And then I looked under the hood and I found that it was due to volatility. Because natural gas and for, or even something that um, something like cryptocurrencies has a lot of volatility. Yeah. But a market like uh, bonds has very little volatility. I mean, less. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, bonds, they go up 0.1% per day, 0.1% down, but uh, cryptocurrency can go 5% up or down in a single day. Stocks yeah, even like, more, right? 5% is a, it's a Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> so so when, I, when I looked at it, I said, you know, percent, you got percentage on bonds, you got percentage on crypto or, or natural gas, but it doesn't compare. But I said, uh -huh. okay, the difference is volatility, and that was the breakthrough. To cut a long story short, so instead of dividing by uh, price, I divided by volatility in, in specific average true range. And having that normalized indicator, then I started creating techniques. I found ranges when it creates overbought and oversold levels, creates uh, fast and momentum. So I created the seven range rules, as I call it. Um, I took the uh, name actually from someone called Andrew Cargo. A friend of mine passed away. So I created the range rules in this in this paper. It is uh, is outlined, and then I created this indicator. I've been I even have it and before. Like I mentioned, there's no pitch. People can have it for free. And having these seven ranges, the range rules, I can identify what the market is, whether it's overbought or oversold, but truly overbought, not like you have here with the stochastic oscillator when it gets yes. just high. And when so risk level one. To the upside risk the, and uh, these range rules come as an acronym of seven r so risk to the upside risk to the downside i've got so when you're coming off of uh, a risk i mean oversold it's rebounding if it continues then it goes rallying risk again to the upside then it is retracing then it is reversing and then risk to the downside so that's six so it's the seventh if it's ranging Mm -hmm. So if you apply a time filter, for example, if the uh, indicator does not go very wildly up and down, but stays within a range, it means that there's no much motion. And that's so, one of the, the problems that trend following indicators have. Exactly. Is that you, if you cannot filter them, but with the MACDV, you can actually filter it. So, if I, so to cut a long story short, if I say the MACDV stays within a range for a few days, then it, the market is ranging. So using these seven core ranges, 
combining with other tools, you can create a lot of patterns very systematic. I see we have to do another session together, <laughs> you know, um, but here now, so you created actually the first indicator probably that is working also in the ranging market and also in trending markets, which, which is a major challenge always to define when, when I'm ranging and when I'm trending. Exactly. It can, it, it, it can do it in a very simple and mechanical when it's trending or when it's, uh, uh, when it's ranging. That's amazing. So, but I mean, you mentioned in, also in the previous sessions and also here that you do fundamentals and you do technical. So you use this indicator that you created by your own in probably the lowest time frame, as I assume, because in the bigger time frame you use fundamentals, right? So yep. you use the indicator for the momentum for the signal to enter. Yes, that said, uh, Gil, you can, of course, you can use it on the monthly chart as well. For there is no, there's nothing wrong with it, and sometimes I use that as well to get a gauge of you know what's because I want to be doing multiple time frames, not just on the factors but also on the momentum. So, for example, for some patterns, I may have okay, I want the MACD, the MACDV actually, to be doing something on the weekly chart. So I, I do, to be completely honest with you, on a, on a, um, as a setup for a technical reason. It's just that the bulk of my work on the uh, other time frames, the monthly and the weekly is primarily fundamental, but on the weekly I do use technicals as well. Okay, okay. So or another pattern that you can use, I'm just giving you the, the secret of secrets. I mean, the, you might say, okay, on the weekly chart, I want to be having uh, the histogram because that has also been normalized to be in an uptrend and then look on the daily to look at the MACDV as well. So the MACDV histogram to have is at a setup on the weekly and the MACDV itself, not the histogram on the daily. Amazing. So, so you look, when I understand you right, you look at the fundamental picture, you yeah. get a general view of the direction based on fundamental analysis and the COT report and seasonals, you get a bias. That's what I understand, right? Uh, absolutely. Let me... Um, I don't know if it would be possible. I have a, a PowerPoint presentation, just one slide. It doesn't, unfortunately, it, it doesn't it will have be not. It, it, it will not be possible, but what we can do is, so it maybe- have charts on it though. May, maybe show, tell me a chart that you want to show, uh, and then let's start from the big picture and try to scroll down from the big picture to detail. Let me give me a second. Yes, to give me a chart. Right. So I've got, um, I'm not sure if it's possible to share it. Yeah. In any case, I've got a chart here of the whole process, how it works. So, so we will do another session probably right. on this, right? Okay. No problem. <laughs> um, but let's say, give me a chart or let's also maybe ask the viewers if they want to see a certain chart and that you are analyzing it for them a little bit. Yeah, okay. O obviously, it will be just for technical reasons. It won't be for, you know, the fundamentals and the whole thing. But yeah, gladly. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I would actually also like the fundamentals, like you, just your general view. Let's say, I mean, everybody's always interested in gold. I don't know if gold is your core market. You, you want to start? You want to see gold? Yeah, yeah, sure. Have, okay. Uh, have a chat to gold, please. So we go here into and they start in the monthly chart? Uh, yes, well, for the monthly chart, uh, what I would do here, well, for the on, the on the monthly chart, I'm more interested in trend than anything else. And of course, um, on the monthly chart, I usually put statistics, economic statistics that underlying it. On the, the monthly chart, I usually have it on a, on a close only basis. I'm not interested in the highs and the lows. Um, so what I do is I will overlay at the bottom panel various economic statistics that you can use with, uh, the, uh, with, the, with the market that you're studying. Following that, I will go to the weekly chart do you have any yes. commitment of traders report on your MT4 now? Eh? Because you mentioned I, you use it. I have maybe, I, I mean, I just have the old report open here. The legacy, yeah. 
that's the legacy report. Do you use the, the new or the old one? The legacy. I'm also using the one, but I still continue with the legacy one, the old one. It's easier. It's, yes, it is. It's easier. It's, it's, it gives clearer signals. Yes, it, it does. It does. Well, actually, you can. Yeah. So when I so when I going into the week, I'm, I think I saw one of your spreadsheets also had some kind of a chart with the commercials and the uh, uh, the large specs. Do you have a chart of it, even if even if it's in Excel? A chart for for, for the COT report? Yes, please. Um, for gold. Yeah. Um, I probably. I can show here. It, this is my my data. I, um, gold we have here. All right. Yeah. Okay. So this so is he, here down. We see the price right, in the weekly so chart. It's in a line chart, and here we see the institutionals. All right. Okay. So, so, so we have here the non-commercials, the blue line, absolutely. and the purple line are the commercials. Exactly. So this is this is what. I, so the way you can I look at this is. Two. The first one is patterns of the uh, commercials and the uh, speculators, mm -hmm. or I apply various indicators on the data. The best, I think, the best use is use them in in, co uh, in combination. Okay. So through through that, my work says that um, I'm bullish on uh, bullish on gold. Okay. As an outlook. On the shorter time frame, there are indications that uh, a market may actually uh, need to cool off a bit because of the of the the thing that we yeah, saw. We had the, yeah, we had the, the, well, basically, for, I don't think. Well, for if we if we switch from fundamentals to technicals, uh, the technicals can be trends, momentum, volatility. Pattern recognition, swings highs and swing lows, and mm -hmm. market structure, and then relative strength. So these are the core five uh, uh, aspects of price. So I don't have any overbought or oversold indica uh, indications coming from momentum, like MACTV or the MACTV histogram, but I have from volatility. Okay. So, so it needs to work off that higher volatility, and then um, because, uh, as Bollinger says, High volatility, low volatility is where trends are born. High volatility is where they go to die. So, so you think, so we have here too high volatility and you think this uptrend is going to die? Uh, or slow want, down? In the, short, in the short term, I think the market will cool off. Okay. So in order to bring um, my view into action, like I mentioned, the four steps, setup, signal, stop and size. What we are talking about, and of course I will use my own tools, I won't be just eyeballing the chart like indicators and everything, the setup. Now once I have, say for example, I'm look at the setup and I'm say bullish or bearish on something, the signal generation, I have a system who will tell me enter now, enter there. But I will not use it on my own, on its own, just because um, it gave a signal. It has to be put in context of the setup. Okay. And or for the, to, so to be from a signal point of view, um, if it goes below, I think it's, if memory cell Tuesday's lows, you might have a short term sell. Okay, so if I go into the daily chart, we are in Thursday, so Tuesday low, if you go here below this level, it's a sell. A short term sell. So. Yes. Now, this is the where big it... picture you say it didn't change, right? Yes. So this is where it becomes discretionary. And or judgmental because your fundamentals may say one thing, but if you get on the short term something uh, which is counter to that, you may say, okay, I don't want to be taking the risk going counter the trend. So it, no, it may be a matter of personal choice to be short or flat. I understand. It, so that, that's where it becomes a personal issue. Some may be more. Because if you see now you're massively against the trend, eh? the long term trend is up, the short term trend is up, the intermediate trend is up. So you have to be really, really careful going against <laughs> the trend. I, I don't want to be. Usually, for as far as I'm concerned, I try to avoid going against the trend. I, I've been burned so many times. I, uh, <laughs> I've learned my lesson. But you know, what I find fascinating, and this is what I see always with experts, 
And I see this again also with you. And this is so special and I, I want to share it because I think it's for the viewers also. You have, you have studied the markets really deeply. You developed your own indicator. You make back testing and everything. And in the end, you still also part discretionary. And I think this is, I see this by the way with all successful traders. And I think this, there is a truth in it. Trading is not only, even if we master it, even if we study it, even if you want to try to quantify it, there is also a part of it that is art, maybe experience, or I don't know how to call it. I completely, I completely agree with you, completely. And I think the, the main point is, yes, I mean, we, we understand the need for clarity, for discipline, for structure. But uh, unfortunately for us, markets change. Mm -hmm. So we have to uh, combine the need for clarity and discipline with adaptability. I wish it was as simple as getting a, a mathematic <laughs> formula and it would work forever. It doesn't. On a first principles basis, like say momentum in general, as a principle, it works. But whether which tool you use, the settings, these evolve around the you know, market cycles and so on and so forth. So but that's why the way, you have to keep a discretionary part to it. I mean, this is so fascinating. This is for me very, very fascinating because I struggled in 2016. I had a trading strategy that worked very, very well. And from 2012, I made amazing a lot of money. And then 2013, I made good money. 2014, I made a little bit money. 2015, made very little money. And 2016, it stopped to work, my trading strategy. And it was for me a huge struggle between the things that I learned to have to be disciplined and just to continue. And it's just a statistical game. And recognizing that markets are changing. And, and, and this struggle really kicked me out of my comfort zone. And, and I, would, I, I think I could talk to you just about this thing that you're saying, that markets are changing. I could talk to you to a, an hour about it because I think this is absolutely amazing what you're saying here. But we are already at the end of our second session. It's unbelievable. Um, Alex, I so much want to thank you for, for giving your knowledge here. It is an absolute honor to have, have you here. Thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed that conversation together. It was, it was, I mean, literally the two hours passed by and I think if you asked me how much time I think I uh, spent time talking with you, I'd say probably half an hour. It's for me the same, absolutely the same. Um, and so EMG is, uh, BMG is asking which kind of indicator would you recommend? So obviously BMG, he is, recomm he is recommending Mac. DV, that's a... <laughs> uh, let, me, let me actually refer the question. I, I think that you need uh, for the job you want, I don't think there is one perfect tool to do the whole job. So if you want trend, you need another one. If you want momentum, so it's the best thing to create a taxonomy of, so MACTV is for momentum. If you want to use it for trend, I would say something else. So if you, it's perfect, so uh, if a pattern recognition, we use something else. There's no perfect indicator that goes for everything. Of course, if you ask me, you're in a desert island, and you have to use one indicator. Uh, in that case, I would probably use any indicator because I wouldn't care. <laughs> so yeah, just make sure you don't, uh, I don't want to be, uh, MACDV is a, truly an innovation, but I want to be mispresenting as like the be all and all of everything. It, it just, it has its time and place. It's good for that. But for other things, you may need other tools. Thank you so much, Alex. It was an absolute pleasure. Me, I man. hope to see you soon again. Absolutely. My, my best bye to bye. everyone at XM, you did a, a wonderful job. Thank you so much for organizing this. Everyone, uh, you, Evangelia, Anna Maria, Vimos, everyone, it was a wonderful effort. Uh, congratulations for that, for bringing education to the uh, people, because I, I think they really need it. And, um, and that's the it diff it's a big difference what you're doing um, because information is not knowledge and you're trying to bring knowledge not just information absolutely well, thank you so much thank you have a nice day you too bye bye